Hi Guzika Khalsa, welcome to Fatah. My name is Dr. Savi. You're tuning in to the best of Savi 6 2011. It's a special compilation program that we put together just to show you all the exciting guests and the key issues that have been raised over the last year and that continue to resonate with us as Sikhs. Hi Guzika Khalsa, welcome to Fatah. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to uh, an episode. We're going to call this program uh, Savi 6, probably named after myself, uh, Dr. Savi. Uh, I think it was on the Sikh channel, um, say, a year or so ago, two years. Um, it's been going a while now. I've been away. Good to be back. And uh, we're going to be presenting a current affairs program, hopefully every Friday um, at about this time, 9 o'clock. Uh, this particular episode that we're going to be talking to you today about is about the turban issue. And uh, so what does the turban issue actually mean? What we're considering is, if you're a Sikh, you wear a turban, you go on holiday like everyone else, what kind of issues do you fe face actually in uh, the airport? Uh, what kind of situations are you involved in, maybe in your workplace? Uh, but really we're going to focus more on the airport issues. What are people doing at the moment? What, what are the issues? Is there anything that we're doing in terms of uh, European representative uh, to ensure that we get a fair chance? Uh, I know when I go on holiday, for example, to the US or to uh, Spain, I almost feel a little bit victimized when I'm actually standing in the queue uh, and eventually I'm put on one side. Uh, it happened to me in almost every single airport in the U.S. I think the U.S. are probably a little bit more mature in one sense that they've got the, uh, the TSA rules, but we'll kind of uncover that as we go along in the next 45 minutes or so. So welcome to the show, and um, I'm just going to get the guests to introduce themselves. I know some of the guests very well, personally, as friends, and uh, I'd like to uh, start off with Gupri. If you could just go one by one and just tell us who you are and where you come from. Don't worry, it's not a, it's not a contest. <laughs> Hello, I'm Gupri Singh and uh, I work as a project manager in telecommunications and I also do seva at the central Gurdwara Khalsa Jatra London, the oldest Gurdwara in uh, Europe. Is it like a uh, hundred years plus? Yeah, we're uh, 103 years now. Mm. While you're there, tell us, you've, gonna, you've done a book as well, haven't you? Yes, we've done a book called The Khalsa Jatra British Isles, covering mm. the history from uh, 1908 to 2008. Wow, impressive. Yeah. I remember seeing uh, in the first few pages there's a picture of Indajit uh, Singh, isn't there? Yes. As a, as a baby. Yes. Uh, very very, very, very young Indajit Singh. <laughs> <laughs> um, but that was in the uh, early part of the, the century. Um, but that was in the uh, early part of the, the century. Okay. <laughs> uh, let's move on to... Hi. Like Khal Savai Fadeh. My name is Jaspal Singh. I'm also from Central Gudara Khalsa Jatta London in Shepherd's Bush. I do Seva there as well. And I'm also representing Sea Council UK, uh, which has been in formation for the last 10 months now. It's an organization which has been uh, created by over 100 Gurdwaras and about 50 different Sikh organizations from UK uh, for the Sikh problems uh, that are, we are facing in UK and in Europe. As we go further in the program, we will discuss, like Dr. Sevi said, that is there any representation happening in Europe, and we would come forward with what we have done in Europe. One of, one of the things I, I would say is that, I mean, there are many groups or, uh, or, or uh, representatives, uh, whether they're individuals mm -hmm. or there's large groups as well. I think there's a group called a Network of Sikh, uh, Sikh uh, yeah. uh, Organizations. And you've got to say, they all do good work. Absolutely. They, they Absolutely. all do great work. And, and it's good that we have it, you know, and on all the work that you do. Absolutely. I've heard that you've done a lot of work recently in mainland Europe uh, to help raise the issue. Absolutely. So, you know, very well done for that. Thank you uh, very much. Let, let's move on. Why did you go call spell? Why did you stay? My name is Pavinder Singh. I come from Reading. I represent, um, I'm a trustee at the Reading Gurdwara. But I also like to spell Singh Viji here. I'm a, a member of the Sea Council. Uh, for me, the Sea Council makes a, is a national body and that is made up of member organizations with a, a national objective and aims that, uh, that we need to take the Sikh agenda uh, beyond our local communities and into the national forum. And that, those are the I think these are very important steps um, that the Sikh communities across the UK have come together and decided that, that they need something of that sort of a stature that will represent us a bit more uh, forcefully and equally compared to other organizations. We've been lacking that in the past. Yes, we've had multitudes of organizations. Some of them have been uh, issue-based uh, agenda and, and they've been very good at those issues, uh, fighting for those issues. And, and, but I think we need to just move over, move to a different level where we create institutes and organizations which are structures which are beyond, which are actually nationally representative. Mm -hmm. uh, rep uh, and, and they actually also represent not just 
the Gurdwaras or the Sikhs or the Amritaris or the, the Sara Singhs, but across the whole spectrum of the Punjabis and the Sikhs within the UK. And that hence where the Sikh Council has, uh, has to play a much more prominent part uh, in, in, the, in the, I would say, the next 50 years of our history. 50, okay. Well, let's kind of uh, carry on this discussion. We've got about 40 minutes worth to, uh, to talk about. Anyone got any examples? You know, what are we talking about? What's the issue here? Standing in line, being asked to take a turban off, or uh, just general rudeness, or is there a situation where uh, clearly there's a, a lack of understanding? I know a lot of questions there, but have you got any um, specific examples? Capri, for example. It comes down to a uh, question of freedom. Uh, right. Why should I be asked to remove my turban? People aren't asked to remove other pieces of clothing in the line. Uh, why is a turban being focused on? Uh, you know, I've heard stories of bombs being sewn into trousers, bombs being sewn into underwear, but you don't see every single passenger being, or shoes, or you don't see every single passenger being strip searched. But the, uh, this seems to be very much focused on the turban. Do you think there's a profiling situation going on here? Definitely there's a profiling situation. Uh, we've had this uh, situation just getting worse since 9-11. No, none of the people involved with 9-11 wore turbans, none of them were Sikhs even, mm. yet, uh, you know, straight after 9-11, the first people to suffer the t attacks and injustices of that were the Sikhs. Right. Yeah, I mean, I guess that there is the confusion, and you could argue as a general point, we are talking about Sikhi as well, that is there education amongst the wider population who are non-Sikhs, um, or people that, I mean, I've said this before, you know, that you know, if you go to a church, whether it be of any denomination, whether you go to uh, Roman Catholic or uh, Anglican, when you walk in, uh, you will find leaflets about, mm. you know, what is Christianity, you know, what's it all about. And as Sikhs, we respect all religions. You know, we don't, we, we don't believe in missionary work, which is to, mm. to push a religion down somebody and say, you must believe this. We believe in mutual respect. But information is the important thing. Even before 9-11, there were still inter, uh, interfaith groups. People did yes. understand each other. Um, so, and I think, I think one of the things to, to really understand is, I mean, I think what you were saying to me, yeah. excuse yeah, me, sure. what you were saying to me earlier on about, is it an education thing from the past? Yeah. Where leaders in the past, did they know who Sikhs were? Do leaders today know who they are? I think that may do, but I don't think they understand the significance of the Dastar. Give an example. Churchill made a speech saying, if you can ask the Sikhs to go and fight for you in the, in, in the trenches, wearing the helmet, uh, wearing the Dastar without the helmet, then you know, you can, you can, you, then you should be allowed, they should be allowed to wear the star and uh, not be, uh, mm. have to wear helmets for when they're riding motorcycles. So here's a leader who saw an example of Sikhs in the trenches with himself, right. and he could fight, he could fight our cause. Mm. Sorry, the, the new leaders of the country t the, today, they haven't been in the trenches, they haven't seen the Sikhs fight alongside with them. They don't understand the significance of the star. The star is a symbol of a religion, mm. but they don't understand the significance of the fact you can take it off. So, right. yes, people of different faith can take their religious uh, artifacts off. They don't see, they can't understand why the Sikhs... Not can. everyone can though, because if, well, if you were a nun, and so, so we take the scenario, go back to the airport thing, right? We're standing in a queue, right? So the Sikh guy, and it might be a Muslim lady who wears a hijab or whatever, and then, uh, although the Sikhs wear turbans because it's our rules to wear a turban, right? With, I believe the hijab thing has other uh, significance amongst the Muslims. But, and it could be a nun who, similarly, has to wear the nun's habit. Yes. Do they ask the nun to take her uh, habit off for a photograph, uh, for her driving license? Do they ask her to derobe uh, in public? Well, there was an interesting uh, situation that happened in Italy where uh, uh, nuns were passing by and a Sikh gentleman was passing by. The nuns were not asked to remove their habit and the Sikh gentleman was taken aside. Mm -hmm. uh, at that point, it got discovered that one of these uh, small Italian organizations representing Sikhs had told the government there, you can go ahead and remove turbans for search. Yeah. So what authority is that person no. got? Yeah, you see, this is where I would like to come in. And, yeah, please, uh, please do. Yeah. Um, what is basically is lack of information for the uh, European governments. If you read the, the, the answers they've given us, Claude Morris, we asked Claude Morris to it's table a question, Claude, Claude Morris, Morris MEP from the UK, MEP. Okay, right. and he's tabled a question for us in European Parliament, asking the European Parliament that why are Sikhs being screened the way they are being, and they've been targeted, and the answer came back that, 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 that they're testing the headgears. They're not targeting, for what I understand, they're not targeting turbans. They've, after 9-11, uh, they've just become very tight in security, 
and they're just testing headgears. And it was such a, the rule was uh, put in on such a haste mm. that they don't realize the Sikhs will be affected because of the turbans mm. as is part of their religion. But that, that's, but that point is, I mean, going back to what Gabriel yeah. said, that, I mean, people can put it in shoes, can't they? Yeah, yeah, exactly. If they want to put something so, in, uh, away. Can I add a little bit yeah, sure. here? Generally speaking, if something triggers for them to wanting to do a further check. Yes. Okay. So, the pr problem that we have is that we have a kada. Okay. So that will trigger... That's something. an opportunity for me, actually. And so <laughs> so that, that, will, that will trigger something. Right. And once it, once, once it triggers something, then they want to do further checks. Now, so you talked about the nuns and you talked about the, the hijabs. If they're not carrying anything me metallic, if they're not wearing a massive uh, mm. cross around their neck, and that doesn't trigger an alarm bells, then they are, they're allowed to go past. So the, based on uh, the Italian Sikhs, we've had some correspondence. They're saying 10% of the Sikhs get caught up in this. Okay. And primarily, the starting point always happens to be the alarm bells going off because they're carrying something metallic. Right. Now, it can be a kara. Right. It, it can be a kanga with a little small metal bit in there. Right, okay. So something that triggers it, unfortunately leads to further searches mm -hmm. on the side. So it's, I'm just thinking, let me just be slightly careful with regards to, it is, I don't think they're purposely targeting the Dastar. There's obviously there are elements of that in there somewhere with regards to the people, they're not, they don't understand the significance of the Dastar and the Sikhs and, and um, mm. but I think that there are, there are other issues which we haven't explored enough to, to understand why we get caught up in the cycle of saying, right, you know, you need to step aside and then I need to carry out further searches on you. Okay, so we could argue, we just summarize these points for a second, we could argue that uh, the point that we started off from, which is more about education, yeah. right? The second thing is miscommunication uh, and rapid decision making, yeah. for example, the point that you made. And it happens you know, with the, that particular security person who's standing there at the time, mm -hmm. it all depends on that person as well. Right. I mean, you'll see that mainly these things have happened in Italy mm -hmm. rather than in other parts of Europe. Mm. And where they, they have been reasonable, but in, it, it, in Italy they have not been reasonable at all. I, I would tell you that's actually a very valid point, because yeah. in a trip that I made last weekend, yeah. which was actually from one of the Balearic Islands mm -hmm. in Spain, yeah. I came back and I managed to go all the way through, which yeah. is fantastic, and I thought, oh, it's really good, I'm all the way through. Yeah. And then just as I was about to put my belt back on, which has a metallic piece on it, uh, the security guy came up to me and he goes, uh, he, he just went, uh-uh, uh-uh, like this, he, he couldn't speak or you know, whatever English, uh, yeah. issues he had. Um, and he went like this, like this. And I said, well, actually, I'm not going to be taking it off. And then he said, uh, would you mind if I kind of just looked at it and just touched it? I said, well, you feel free. If you want to touch that, it's up to you. Uh, and he did. And he said it was fine. Now, in the US, for example, or when I was in uh, Seattle or when I was in, um, in Washington, D.C., uh, on both occasions, I was penned off separately, right, waiting for all the other passengers to go through. Right, and then, ultimately, uh, the guy got a, a swipe and, uh, and, and did all that. The but swab but the, sw the swab, sorry, the swab test. Even the swab test is uh, it's not really very good, is it? It's not, not reliable. Not reliable. Uh, I've heard situations where um, there was one lady wearing a hijab who actually worked at the airport, and um, in fact, airport workers are having to go through these same screenings. And she had the swab test done, and uh, the device said there was a bomb. Okay. Clearly there wasn't, but... Uh, and it's know, a security official. Mm. So it's, uh, yeah, so it's, it's not proven to be reliable. Right. Well, if you're having so this... they've got like equipment now, and they've got technology where you, can do it, where you can just walk through this thing, a bit like that sci-fi movie where you walk through and you're in time... Recall. Uh, total recall. Total <laughs> recall, yeah. <laughs> Arnold Schwarzenegger not hands. All the, you know? all the airports have that. Some of the airports in the UK have that. Right. ...the fact that ultimately you have a responsibility for what was left behind. And today, people still suffer. So that's really the context of the program. It's 1984 from the context of justice and hope, and also considering what the youth think of it today. And I'm going to ask just a general question to my uh, esteemed guests here today. Uh, I will get them to introduce themselves very quickly. And I want to ask them, you know, they watched that program that the BBC did recently called um, 1984, A Sikh Story. I think that's what it was called. I had a few critical aspects of that, and I, I wrote that on my blog, about the fact that it didn't really hit home at the central issue of what was going on, the water situation, the fact that it had been going on post-1947. A lot of people don't recognise the history behind this particular issue. And I really think that when we see youth today, even those that were there at the time, myself, I was a young chap then, uh, and those who weren't born, I think none of you guys were born at that time, um, is the story being rewritten? Is and the word story, it's not a story, it's a fact. The fact is that we do not have justice. 
and we need to continue to fight for it. And those who are there at the time, and those that are the children that are today's youth, need to recognize that we've got to keep this on. The Jews keep it on. They do not forget about the Holocaust, and nor should we as well. So really, I'll get everyone to introduce themselves, and please answer that question. Did you get a chance to watch that program done by the BBC? Yeah. And what were yeah. your views as well? So from the left-hand side, you're going to go first. Um, yeah, my name's Indabar Singh. What do you do? I uh, work in PwC, so price for housekeepers in uh, banking and capital markets finance. Okay, very good. A very interesting job. Yeah, well, yeah, time to time. It depends when it's busy and it's not. Yeah, thank you for coming after work as well. No I problem. appreciate That's your fine. time. Thank you. Yeah. Um, tell us your name, buddy. Uh, my name is Shamshir Singh. I'm from Southall. Okay. I've lived here my whole life. Yeah, and you do uh, IT stuff as well, don't you? Yeah. And a whole variety um, of things. Yeah, yeah. Okay, I know these things. <laughs> <laughs> okay, and? I'm Bajit Singh. I'm a civil servant at home office. Okay, very good. And you do some work for Casa Aid as well, don't you? Try to get more of You do some work for Casa Aid, yeah, absolutely. Um, so, yeah, answer to a question, if you guys have got a view. Do you watch that programme? What do you think of that programme, then, by the BBC? Um, yeah, I mean, I, I definitely, yeah, I did watch it. And to be honest, before that, I had, I had a knowledge about 1984, not kind of in-depth, like, you know, the political movement behind it, not so much about Bindar Awali, only obviously about the attack. You know, you go to the Golden Temple as a kid and you see the pictures and stuff, and you start asking your mum and dad, oh, if you were here, you know what happened at the time. And, it's only when you kind of get older that you start to realise, well, you know, there was actually a lot of big, big story behind it. It doesn't just happen in 1984. It's, you know, 78 was it was in the Bengali movement and before that and probably since the partition of India, really. So, yeah, um, I think in a way it's good that the programme happened so that even we can be critical about it and say it didn't really, you know, look at every single aspect. But for the majority of people there, they learnt something from the programme, so especially the bit, you know, when you saw the, um, the widows in Delhi. Anyone who watched that definitely would have got emotional kind of watching that, you know, mm -hmm. think, you know, how can this kind of happen? Was it 26 years? I think maybe? in that particular programme, they had a, a girl who was being interviewed, and uh, she, uh, a lady, I should say, was being interviewed, and I think she was under a bit of pressure as well, wasn't she? From somebody yeah, then she broke down in tears and stuff. Yeah, and I think there was a situation where a particular politician had been named and um, mm -hmm. was causing some kind of, um, I guess, behind the scenes uh, trouble for her as well about not appearing the witness. Mm -hmm. um, and that, that's, even after 27 years, they know they did wrong, and they know they're trying to get to them, you know, mm. which I think is quite interesting. You know, um, so what about um, Shinfei? What do you think of that program? Um, I thought, you know, um, it didn't really do justice to the subject at all. Um, I thought the presenter was inappropriate. I thought the whole, the way the program was done was inappropriate. Okay. Um, it's such a, um, a deep issue, um, and it's rooted in so much history. Um, do you think it brought that pain? Um, I think, yeah, it did bring out the pain, an element of the pain, but I mean, you can't even begin to describe the levels of atrocities that were suffered upon the Sikh community um, by those that are in power. And that one fact I don't think was made clear enough by that program. It wasn't made clear that the people that were perpetrating, committing these acts, are the same people that are in power in the Indian state mm -hmm. today, this day, this day and age. While they were there, you know, laughing around and going about in India, they didn't highlight that fact that it's the same people, it's the same po politicians. It's in fact, the people that were holding lower positions at that time are holding higher positions now. They've, they've um, tightened their grip on power and authority. They haven't loosened it. Um, Sikhs can never get justice in an environment like that, especially a mainstream organization like the BBC isn't willing to really show the reality of the issue, and they never will because this country has billions of dollars worth of trade relations you know, with India. And with do, you think, do you not think it's an irony of the fact that at the time there was a Congress government that was in charge, and now the Congress government is in charge, and now you've got a Sikh uh, gentleman who's leading it? Um, I don't know. Um, I don't know whether you can call uh, in the Sikh, I don't know. Um, I think it's it's a it's a it's a very deep issue. I mean, on one hand, you've had people that gave up their whole, their lives, their family lives, their children have suffered. You know, their wives, their daughters have suffered. Um, you know, it's not just the people that have lost their. The Rotary District Governor for District One One Four Zero, which covers an area down to Odium, across to Croydon, as far north as Kew Gardens, and down south as Banstead. We're a service organisation. We're the leading service organisation. And across the world, we're in represented in 200 countries, and there are 1.2 million members. So pretty impressive figures on what we do as a service organization. And in fact, the projects in the UK, projects in projects countries, all over projects the world. In and you went to India recently, didn't you? I went in February to India to do a polio immunization program. And I went with 100 other Rotarians right. from France, from, from Australia, from Canada, from the US, and 14 young people from Iceland. 
and one of the road tractors, one of the young people, they brought their grandmother with them. Not because she was mm. going to be protecting her, mm. but the grandmother said, I'd like to go with you mm -hmm. and actually go and actually do something. That's very nice. Yeah. So that's, mm. that's me. Okay, that's excellent. Well, thank you for that. Okay, we'll come back to you. Capri, on, you're on last week. <laughs> yeah, welcome back, back your, here again. In your other suit this time. Cool. We, we yes, only yes. mention yes. the brands. No, no, no. We, <laughs> no brands mentioned. No brands mentioned. No free advertising no. here. <laughs> so it's a good breed thing again, and uh, I'm a, uh, one of the committee members at Central Gurdwara Khalsa Jatta London, the oldest uh, Sikh Gurdwara in Europe. And uh, uh, I also work in the, the, as a project manager in the telecommunications industry. And also the other thing is, not a lot of people know, you did a lot of law, didn't you? You're, you're kind of your, uh, you want the whole world to know that, that, <laughs> that you are... Uh, uh, no, no, I... Uh, you did I, law, didn't I, you? I, yeah, you start getting people phoning you up and asking for all various uh, bits of legal advice. If, and, if we uh, let a couple hundred pounds, mate, you're fine. <laughs> you're fine you're <laughs> should, should we mention that we've known Savvy for a few years? Yes, yes we talk, have. Don't tell people how many, please. Yeah. Because if we tell him, then <laughs> they'll work out how old he is. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, yeah. he's not 21. Yeah. 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 We're about same age. Um, but you tell us all about the last thing. thing, yeah. And like I so said, we did some stuff recently. And yeah, we did the Berlin on two London rides. That's right. good fun. And um, I'm not part of any committee or any group. Um, just uh, I work as a recruiter. Okay. He is a good Sevadara at the Central He's, a good good He's yeah. uh, always coming and helping out. Absolutely. And you did some pretty amazing stuff recently, didn't you? You went all the way from Southall to Shepherd's Gurdwara in one night a few nights ago, you know, making sure that everything was okay, you know. Yeah, I mean, there wasn't just me. There was a group of us. Right. We just decided that, you know, there was just text going around that people were going to come to I Southall. Yeah. Um, I actually thought about that earlier on before I saw that text. That, you know, Southall would be a likely target yeah. if they were going for jewelers. And, um, mm. yeah, we went down to Southall and just sort of, there were too many people there. Right. Effectively, there were thousands. Right. <laughs> like about a thousand or <laughs> Including plus. the BBC. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. They were low in numbers. Maybe, maybe about 20 policemen. Right. Okay. <laughs> If you're lucky, and um, and we just felt that there was there was no need for more people to be there at that time. Okay. And then group read. Yeah, had a bit of an Facebook. I, I, I saw a Facebook statement, didn't I? Something about more people to come to Sanchez. Yeah, and absolutely. So we, yes. so as a group, we went down. You rose to the occasion and went down there. Well, see, the interesting thing here is that uh, you could say the yobos and the thugs were using social networking to get organised, but so were we to counteract them. So we, should have been, we should have actually been more media savvy, though, to be honest. Yeah. Mm. But those are things that we didn't really use that could have been better. I mean, okay. I, I um, personally felt South that wasn't well organised. Well, I don't know. Um, in, in Hounslow, the local authority actually put up a, a notice up on Facebook asking residents to stay in. The police were out doing what they were supposed to do. Mm. And even this evening, on our way to um, the studio, Savvy and I went through Hounslow High Street, and the police were out in force at the bus garage in the high street, making sure things are, are in a you know fit manner. So but this, but, the, but the, the whole point, point about the social point. media is that yeah. the local authority were doing it. I know that many of my friends were also being prepared that night as well, because most of us were concerned, as we live in the London area, was that it had reached Ealing, Southall wasn't very far away, mm -hmm. Hounslow wasn't very far away, and most yeah. of us were trying yeah. to think about how do we protect ourselves. Yeah, yeah, well, in that's the reason went I went down. But, but what I meant was, just so I can clarify, because it can be taken the wrong way, but what I meant by media savvy was perhaps a bit more to do with the fact that there's things like WhatsApp messengers and instant messaging, yeah, right. which is very similar to BBM, yeah. which we could have used a bit more to organise ourselves in Southall, mm. for example, yeah. where you had maybe about a thousand people roaming around right. with no clear leadership. Okay. Uh, and that was one of the things that I felt could have been better organised, yeah, i.e. Yeah, put people on a, on a messaging service where they could sign their email address or mm. their phone number up to it, and it's instant. It's not like Facebook where you have to get an update on your phone. Right, okay. It just automatically updates you. So what I mean about being cutting edge, I mean bleeding edge, not just cutting edge. No, no, no. I think Facebook I think is pretty good, but I think we could be better organized. Especially if you're looking at things like what happened on, you know, the idea of being organized for uh, a potential situation anywhere right. over but a large area where there's not very good, you know, s already set up communication networks. So. This does beg the question of whether, I mean, you go to Mandur. I go to the Mandur, I go to the mosque, and I go to the good bar. Okay. Friday. <laughs> and and you, you, know go, you go to you go to more. Yeah. Uh, uh, well, I do because I'm involved with the interface. Yeah. What do you think about that, Gupri? Well, see, Sikhism. If we look at the beginning, what did Guru Nanak do? He broke the chains of ritualism. These chains that made us slaves. Mm. He made. He, he gave us azadi. He gave us freedom. And it's if we want to then go back today and start putting these chains of slavery back onto ourselves, 
then that's a misfortune. Because if you want to get into ritualism, there are plenty of people who will make money out of you, who will look to scam you, who will look to use you and abuse you. At the moment, you have freedom, and you should enjoy that freedom and use that freedom to join with God. It's just to uh, clarify, uh, as Sikhs, we, we don't do fasts. Uh, we don't do, um, you know, things like dikka and that kind of stuff. You know, and, and, the, and there are reasons for that. It's because I think at the time, the Guru Nanak, and it kind of continued all the way through, right up to modern time, we hope, that, you know, we are free from the superstition aspect because we believe yes. that it doesn't actually do anything. It, like you said, it, it binds you, you know. Um, there should be um, a freer spirit. Yeah. Um, do, do, do you think that's the case? Well, these things have become a barrier, so if people start adopting them again, uh, you right. know, occasionally you, you're starting to see some Sikhs who are adopting uh, ritualism right. again. And uh, you see it coming in many different ways. Yes, you may see the traditional Indian versions coming of it, mm. but you also get uh, other things. You know, people uh, start maybe doing their part in a different way, thinking that, ah, this will maybe help me. You know, it's... Uh, all these different things. I, I actually ran into one odd problem when I was a young lad. I went to one Sikh camp and I made the mistake of wearing a red turban that day and I discovered these people didn't like the color red. They mm. said it incited lustful thoughts. Right. Uh, I had no idea why. You know, if they cut them. Oh, to do this, when I was at school and people mm. used to say to me, uh, you're wearing a blue turban today and, and the yeah. next day I was wearing a burgundy one. And I said, how, did you, how come you changed the color of your turban? And I said, well, the other one's in the wash. <laughs> <laughs> See, people, they start associating colors with ritualism, but Jab Sub tells you, God sees no color. Right, yeah. absolutely. It, everything is created by God. Mm. You know, there's nothing that isn't God. Uh, you know, there are no barriers, there are no uh, superstitions, but it's our manmat that brings it back in. Mm -hmm. But let's go back to the point that isn't it up to the people to be sensible enough to decide what they should or shouldn't do in terms of whether it's appropriate or not? Or do they do it because it becomes habitual, it's like they've always done it, therefore they'll carry on doing it, uh, and then they see no difference. Or maybe they kind of start imagining that if they don't do it, bad things are going to happen, you know? Well, are you talking about the slave mentality here? Well, I guess what it is, is possibly, you know, it goes back to the fear thing, doesn't it? You know, you're, you're fearful of... Well, you know, if you don't do a certain thing, it's going to affect you somehow right. in terms of your karma or whatever. You is know? fear good? Well, we, we are supposed to be fearless, aren't we? Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, so, you know, you want to break away from fear. So why right. adopt something which only enhances your fear, saying that if I'm without this, then I'm in a bad situation? Yeah, but I think the, the problem that you have in, the, in society is that there are people that influence other people. So if we take a wedding, for example, somebody might say, you must do this because, what, they, they won't say that. Um, it's because she, she said or he said it's because we've always done it or it's been mm -hmm. a family tradition yeah. or the fact is that if you don't do it then this may happen to you um, the coconut stuff and all the other things that, that kind of go on you know um, I mean there's, there's obviously there's dangers there with that that creeps in and I think the fear is the main element and I think um, that's probably in every religion really what mm -hmm. it's about do you feel empowered mm -hmm. and I think like for me personally when I was left by coming into Kundalini Yoga what I felt was, I felt really empowered. Because when I went to Espanola and I met a lot of the Kundalini Yoga teachers there, and you know, we were quite fortunate to stay at Guru Ka Singh and Guru Ka Kaur's house, and you know, we sort of spent time with all the, all the women there, I felt that they were very empowered. Mm. And um, you know, they had a practice that helped them to feel empowered. Because you know, like, for example, we do the tuning in, we do the mantras, we understand why we cover our head. We understand about the energy, and then also there are very important things in Kundalini Yoga. We talk about, for example, conscious pregnancy. So, um, you know, before I had my baby, fortunately, I had I was blessed to be part of the golden chain, and then we could instill those um, into our children as well, into our home, into our society, right. and we can do seva. Like, for example, when I was teaching at the addiction center, and I saw how the teachings helped the students, and that's uh, what brings that faith into the teachings. It's interesting actually because I've seen, uh, I think I saw a documentary and a lot of people that were over in the US who had started practicing Kundalini Yoga, they actually became Sikhs themselves, mm -hmm. didn't they? they had, the Kundalini thing was separate, mm -hmm. the Sikhi thing was separate, it yeah. just kind of like, it just kind of emerged from that. They thought, yeah. well, Yogi Bhajan is actually a Sikh, so, and then Yogi yeah. Bhajan himself was saying things like, I look around and suddenly they're all becoming Sikhs. What's going on? Yeah, you know? I mean, the people think that Yogi Bhajan went to America and then they became Sikhs. He just went there and he just 
shared what he had to share the religion right. uh, and the sorry the yoga right. and a lot of times what happens and this happens in our classes as well because the teachers want the students want to become like the teachers because oh, really? okay. obviously they see uh, the practice and they see what you're omitting and that's why Yogi Bhajan kept saying that don't focus on the teacher focus on the mm -hmm. teachings that's mm -hmm. why we have the tuning in and we focus on the teachings right. but sometimes students are so much in love with the teachings and then they get very connected to the teacher and that's why you're right that you know they go to it sickly because obviously they see the practice that the teacher has and um, you know the empowerment on the other hand just the experience of the yoga and of merging your consciousness with the universal consciousness can bring you to Fiki. That's what that happened with me. Neither of, I had two Kundalini yoga teachers. Neither of them was Sikh, but I got into Fiki through Kundalini yoga. Mm -hmm. So it doesn't always, it's not always a case of mirroring, mirroring your teacher, trying to become your teacher. It can just be the experience that brings you on a spiritual path. And Sikhi is that path of the seeker. It's, it's, for me, when I came into Sikhi, it was quite weird to see a lot of the rituals or the superstitions because in you, coming you into it, that? I had the idea that there was nothing but you like that. that. Did yeah, you I you did. saw that? Yeah, yeah, I heard people saying, like, um, if you have a brother, you can't wash your hair on a Friday. <laughs> <laughs> what is that about? <laughs> and I see nothing. nothing. Oh, no, no. Is it a Thursday or something? <laughs> it's a day. Like, just just pick a day. You just can't wash your own this day. Any of these oh, little things. Exactly. Yeah. So when I came to Sikhi, for me, it was like the most open path and the most truthful one to yourself and to God without anything in between. Right. Mm. But then you do see that, that are, there are quite a few cultural things in yeah. between. Um, and then how many of them do you adopt? Like with every single one of them you sort of take a step back and you see like, does it affect me? Does it help me? No? Right. Okay, then I just leave it. One of the things that we were talking about just in the green room, there is such a thing, uh, we were talking about the fact that, you know, we're we're born in the UK, mm -hmm. okay, which is, I mean, there are people that have been here for even many years, maybe they were one or two years old, and there's now a third generation mm -hmm. as well. And sometimes I feel that we've got culture that's over here in the UK, mm -hmm. and if I go to India, people will go to me, say to me things like, well, you speak to Punjabi slightly different. And I feel, I feel like okay, all these people that come from India, that, and they know Gurmukhi, they know Punjabi, aren't they so rich in the fact that they know all this, right? Mm -hmm. um, and you're... You come into Sikhi and, and we were just saying earlier on, you want to learn Gurmukhi, don't Absolutely, you? Absolutely. Because yeah. you want to learn about the essence of that, yeah. of what the true Nama it is. It is the language right? of the Gurus. It is yeah. the language of Guru Granth Sahib. Right. So it is the language that you will learn if you come sure. into Sikhi. But then we'll be part Do I want to speak Punjabi at home? That's a different question. Absolutely. I would like my children to grow up and know Punjabi and start learning Gurmukhi. Right. But do they need to know every vegetable in Punjabi? I don't think so. Okay. Um, but yeah. when I go to Gurudra, I do feel it as not only not being fluent in Gurmukhi yet, but not speaking Punjabi is a big hindrance because I can't listen to the Katha. Right. Um, I can't speak to a lot of the people because quite a lot of the elders still speak Punjabi, especially right. in Belgium. Everybody basically only speaks Punjabi. Right. So it is like a, a huge barrier right. um, if you're not Punjabi to come into Sikhi. Okay. Um, but you know, in a way, I mean, I suppose in the UK... It's and it shouldn't be. Yeah. In the, in in the, the UK, UK it is very, very, very different. Yeah, 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 because in the UK, a lot of people do speak Punjabi yeah. and they speak yeah. English. Yeah. They speak, yeah. you know. Punjabis hold a franchise on Sikhism, or is Sikhism universal? I plant tea of all with a lot of devotion. Okay. Yeah. I'm like, where are all the great Sikhs they talk about? Mm. Where are those? You know, so at some point, you get tired of it and you stop going to those things because basically what I learned in today's context, I'll say, that we end up in insulting people's intelligence the way we present information, study spiritual, you know, what is our spirituality, uh, what kind of differences gurus made in South Asian context, and how we as Sikhs need to go extrapolate this worldwide. Well, that's not to say that if you use Google, it's not there. And just to go remind the audience mm -hmm. uh, for a second, you are based in San Antonio, right? Yes. Uh, so it's good that you're over here. Okay. Uh, you recovered okay. from your jet lag earlier on. Um, but, yeah, I mean, by the way, I want to pick you up on this uh, uh, human dynamics thing. Sure. Aerodynamics does have a bit of turbulence when you're flying. Yeah. You know? Well, that's um, why I said aerodynamics <laughs> is still predictable. I develop <laughs> models to predict random vibrations. Absolutely. But human dynamics isn't. Yeah. But so which means it's good. You know, we need to work with basically every personality which shows. For example, gurus dealt with different mindsets. Why are we trying to develop the same mindset today? Are we exploding everyone's divine potential? Well, well, like I, said, I was about yeah. to say before, you know, uh, the question I wanted to ask you really was about the fact that, you know, you talk about the fact that there was all this, you know, you went to these Punjabi classes and, you know, there's more out there. Now, we can find that more if we want to. Sure. We can use Google. Yeah. Uh, you know, we're intelligent enough, some of us, to be yeah. able to 
um, some are better than others, yeah. to be able to use the internet and be able to find that information. Um, so although that probably wasn't there at the time, there's probably no excuse now, is there yeah. really? Well, there are. Uh, I'll give you, I'll cite somebody. Oh, yeah, I, was, I had organized a conference five years back on critical affairs facing the second nation in, in San Antonio, where we invited national organizations of six in the U.S. and Canada. And, you know, we had asked one of the five-star generals to come speak to us regarding how do you do strategic planning. Okay. He came up mm -hmm. to the dais, and, you know, he goes, this is how he started. He says, I was going to come talk to a Sikh group, so I went and asked Mr. and Mrs. Google, tell me something about six. Mm -hmm. He said, I went to 20 sites. They had 40 different answers of who you are. So that's internet for you. Okay. And let me give another scenario. I remember I did a course in college called The Real American Hero. I remember Dr. Thomas walked in the class very first day, and he said, you know, although I'm an engineer by training, but I was taking a lot of these courses to develop different faculties of mine. And first day he walks and he says, this class is about detecting bullshit. Mm -hmm. That's exactly how I put it. It's a PhD doctor, and that's how he explained. Right. He said, in my class, you will get a pass or failing grade if you develop what he called your bullshit detectors. The, the so the same thing yeah. is this. You know, we hear so many things. Yeah. How do you, you know, this is epistemology in acad academic studies. Right. How do you know, what do you know? So, you know, are we going to be uh, following something because your Gyani ji and my Dada ji or my dad believes it? Or is there uh, underlying thesis, underlying feeling which Guru Granth Sahib is generating? Well, you could arg argue that the source of the knowledge, the source of the, the pureness, the essence of what Sikhi actually is, is actually in the Guru Granth Sahib. Right? There's obviously the fact of interpretation, but if, if we say there's kind of religious knowledge and there's also historical in the context that there is um, what's happened to the Sikhs over the years, you know, what's happened, the, the martyrdoms, the you know, freedom fighting and the freedom fighting that continued even up until the Second World War, mm -hmm. you know, and even happens today as well, you know, you know, through the report from the other week, you know, the fact that Sikhs are there and they're trying to help other people in other communities, right. so they still have that. I already saw a t-shirt on that, by the Did way. Did you? Really? Stay calm is the phrase. Yeah. It says, stay calm, call us sick. <laughs> well, it's very nice. It's good publicity. Right. <laughs> but coming back to the, the point, you've got, you know, religious knowledge, you know, which you should always go back to Guru Granth Sahib to actually, mm -hmm. you know, uh, really focus in on. And then you've got this historic information. Yeah. Now, there's a phrase that people use yeah. that says that those who are in power yeah. are the ones that have the ability to rewrite the history. Yeah. Right. And unfortunately, what ends up happening is... Uh, the people, after a number of generations, read that history. Yeah. Um, you know, the, the fact that the terrible things that happened in, uh, you know, the Holocaust, yeah. you know, um, we know about that today. It's well, uh, you know, referenced. There are movies about it. Sure. Uh, there are, you know, countless writers that have said and condemned it and Hitler's uh, entire extermination well, of I mean, the Jewish we, community. We, right. where, are our, where are our well, writers? Well, let me build you know. on that. So that's actually a good point. You know, in our case, if I may quote, you know, one of my favorite writers is Professor Puran Singh. And he writes very eloquently, in one quote he says, the history of Sikh people is still a sealed book. Why? And that's, I'm conjecturing how. Here, he's, because it's a sealed book, because who is telling our history? Right. First Bengalis wrote about it, then European writers wrote, then Indian nationalists wrote. We haven't even written our history. Mm. Like you talk, you reference Holocaust. I mean, sure, there are still denials in Louisiana and in Iran, even some in Europe as well, yes. and in Britain as well, right. but most of the public accepts it. Most of the public so accepts it. So let's yeah. to bring our Holocaust, or what we will call a Lukara tradition. Yeah. We can't even tell our own story. So this is what I'm, you know, history is very important. But even the litmus test for history for us comes from Guru Granth Sahib. At least for me it does. Mm. Where it says, Babaniya kahaniya put saput karin. Only tell that story, that sakhi, that narrative which has the capacity to transform an average child into a progeny, which means onus is on you. Mm. Are you going to repeat everything you hear? We call that gossip, I think. Right. You have to have some onus on yourself that this narrative has the capacity to transform you. So that's the history we need to tell. But you see, that narrative you know, is there, that purity is there, but the ability and the self-realization, I call it, I, my favorite word of the week at the moment is self uh, yeah. sorry, uh, you know, a little hyphen in the middle. Sure. I think there is. Uh, self-realization is when you yourself understand what you need to do sure. and you understand that you need to go and seek that knowledge, you will go and do it. But how do you bring that about in people? Is that something that you just got to wait a few years and go, oh, okay, I'm now ready to actually understand what I need to know? Or uh, is it something that you ingrain to your children that you say to them, 
you know, it's important for you to know this. It's important well, for you to go and seek out this information. True right? it is. But, you know, let's say when you are doing parenting, there are certain things you are teaching your children, right? Right. Basically, we need to teach them to think also. While we are teaching them part, while we are teaching them uh, Kirtan, while we are teaching them historical narratives, here is what it boils down to for me. You look at any Sakhi, let's even just look at the lives of Guru Nanak Sabha, and there are so many Sakhis which are mm. popular, yeah. narratives essentially, right? right? You know what they all boil down to? You look at any Sakhi, he's, Guru Nanak Sabha is asking a simple question after each thing. He says, does this make sense? Mm. As six, we have stopped asking this. Does this make sense? If somebody says that today, we just say, oh man, don't create, you know, waves and let's just do this. Yeah, even this is acceptable. So we make everything status quo. Right. Nanak, is that because we're afraid to challenge We are it? very afraid. We are very afraid because we ourselves are ignorant. You know, any little knowledge is a very dangerous thing. Mm. So right now we are getting little knowledges. And it's getting dangerous. In fact, we use the word oh, this is controversial, don't say this. Mm. And actually, I want to talk about that word for a second, if you don't mind. Yeah. Well, the word you know, what is controversial? Yeah. Mm. Guru Nanak was controversial every time he did something. Mm. On his wedding day, people were trying to kill him. There was a Gurdwara, Kachi Khan, then Batala. Mm. Why were they trying to, they hated him so much? Because he was questioning the superstructure, which said this is the only way to do things. So we are the followers, if you say you're a follower of Sikhi, this is our tradition, mm. where we say, no, we must know why this way. While we develop our feelings in our faith, while we build the faculties of our mind, we need to still question because if you don't question, corruption comes in but, but and yeah. you know all the corruptions have come in among us, mm. within us, as well as in our institution. But in a positive perspective, because it's always uh, important to, uh, to put it from a, a positive perspective, and uh -huh. that is that, you know, I often think it's quite amazing when you, uh, when you see it. As Sikhs, if you see something happening, I, I, I see it with other people as well. It, most cases with Sikhs, if somebody is fallen over or a lady needs to, you know, help or whatever, there is a Sikh guy that will always say, I know it sounds like a trivial example, but yeah. if there's somebody on a train, I normally notice, you know, a Sikh guy, do you want to sit down? Because, you know, yeah. it's kind of like, it's almost in our psyche yeah. to help other people. Do you, do you agree with that or you disagree with I, that? I agree, but I would say that we don't need to pat ourselves in back just on uh, I, yeah. I agree, but I would say that we don't need to pat ourselves in back just on uh, I'm not saying that, I'm just saying well, that. you kind of are. Yeah? Yes, but I think that's a normal human behavior. Right. And okay. I want to separate the two things. Right. A normal human behavior is we all, I don't know anyone who doesn't feel good when they help. Right. So we are supposed to do that. This is who we are. Mm. You know, we don't do this because I'm a sick. We do this because this is the right thing to but do. But the true person that does it in a selfless way, yeah. which is what we're supposed to be doing yeah. when we do seva, well, is that we don't expect anything in back. True, but you know? I think when somebody's helping somebody on a tube, mm. I'm sure they're not expecting anything in back they're at not that expecting point. Anything back. So this one yeah. thing, that's a normal human behavior. Right. Criteria in Sikhi are much bigger, mm. because Sikhi is about developing every faculty we have, every feeling we have. So for example... Um, and so I end up making many good friends from Haitian people, mm. and it's just treating them with respect, really. And, and in turn, they gave me respect back. Because there's a, a dignity thing as well, isn't there, I guess? Yeah. Um, I wanted to say to the audience that's out there, later on what we're going to do is we are actually going to take some calls as well. Uh, so if you want some direct questions that you want to put to our guests today, you know, maybe you're thinking about doing volunteering or maybe you want to kind of seek firsthand um, basically what's actually happening out there. Now, um, you've been to Haiti a couple of times. There are other things that you've done. Recently, you've done some water uh, distribution over in Libya, haven't you, on the Libyan border to, where's the Libyan border to what? Tell us a bit more about uh, that. Yeah, it was um, the Libyan conflict in the early days caused, uh, I think, half a million immigrants who were working in the oil industry, etc., in Libya to leave, to flee the country. Right. They were caught in between and uh, unfortunately, yeah, they were fleeing, they were robbed as well by the local okay. Libyan Didn't military as well. Is it really? no. So, no, it doesn't anyway. Mm -hmm. So, they were, we were working on the it's called a camp, Shusha camp, on the borders of Tunisia and Libya. Is that one of their terms, or is that...? It's a town called Shusha, it's a basically the, um, uh, on, on the border. It's a very... It's Ras is there, yeah. is the main town, then you've got a little town, and the camp became known that at a, one time the camp had 25, 30,000 people, people yeah. and when you uh, walk into that camp, you're working in Tunisia, and it's French and Arabic, and uh, luckily the way we work, we always approach local organizations to work with us. So the Tunisian Rotary Club, New Generation Club in Tunis, 
contacted them. They spoke English very, very good. Got on with them, made links. So when we landed, they waited for us, mm. picked us up at the airport, made arrangements to go and visit the camp so they could speak the language. And these are all foreign workers, not Libyans. They were all foreign workers, right. Africans, Asians, Bangladeshis, right. Pakistanis. Pakistan is very happy to see us. Bangladesh is really happy. So Dadi, Dadi, help us. We need help. But we had to make an assessment. It was probably, I think, probably the most violent place we worked so far. Really? There was mass fights. Mm. Uh, you're what, standing fight, there. Fights for food or fights for... There's like uh, queues, like, uh, imagine you're in the desert. It's in the desert. Right. Very, very hot. Mm. Lack of water. People are queuing up like four hours to get some food. And they're like uh, dehydrating as well. Dehydrating, standing, no shade. You're queuing up four hours, like half mile queues, no joke. Mm. Queues going around the camp. Suddenly, some of the troublemakers, they were known. There were some countries that labeled saying, watch out for these certain African countries. They cause headaches. And uh, they would push in, okay. and that was it. Right. It will erupt, food will get chucked away, um, broken bones, fatalities, and you were just watching it. I remember the first day I got there with the Rotary Club guys, there was a lady, a guy, and a driver. And, and these Malians were marching on the road. They want to go back to Mali. Mm. It's not our fault, it's not the NGO's fault. The Mali government has got the money. The UN will not put them up yet. So they were demonstrating on the road. As we pa passed, they saw us pass. They ran after the car. It's in a little video clip. All right, yeah. Like trying to attack the car. And then when we got there, there was a tiny military, like as big as a studio place. And they're trying to control all this. So I stood in the side of this army camp thinking, okay, this guy comes up with a massive rock. I got a photo on one of my Facebook camps. And he's trying to chuck it and he looked at me. He's like, what's this guy with a beard and turban? Who's right. this guy? He's like totally shocked and then he just went like that and walked off. Okay. I was thinking, well, so that was the latest one and most violent and, and a couple of other volunteers went. My missus went as well to see what we do actually. Mm. It's not holiday, what we go and get up to. Right. And the day Baljeet Singh from Kalta and my missus went, it was the most violent day. There was oh, a right. thousand or fifteen hundred guys, imagine that, right. fighting each other. Okay. You can see them coming towards you, going back, cars moved out, dragged them into the tents. The people in the tent cooking broke the spade to get ready for the sticks to fight back. Unbelievable. It was, it was uh, I think, an eye-opener. Right. So uh, that was, <laughs> but we delivered water. We, you know, we're determined. I I'll say, I'll say, yeah. we're not shying away. We don't just, like I said many times, put some boxes together, take a photo, say, look what we're doing. We're doing substantial work now. Right. With other NGOs, talking local grassroots organizations. Tell us a little bit about, I mean, let's go back to Haiti for a second. But thanks for that, by the way, Rocky. That's quite terrifying in one sense. I was but in Windsor having a meal with my family when he texted me literally just after it happened saying it's one of the most dangerous days of my life right. in there and obviously I was in a different world but I kind of just wish you it know, was... You know, I often think that. I've kind of blogged about it on my uh, blog site, you know. Uh, I've, I've said, well, you know, like there's so much difference in the world, isn't there? There's, there's a part of the world which is really, really rich and another part of the world which is really poor and there's... It's almost like we live in a sense of like that mention. Well, one of the reasons things are slow is it's intentionally slow. If witnesses are dying, if there are people, uh, judiciary and CBI, which stands for Central Bureau of Investigation of India, is delaying its reports. If the cases are not being on docket, essentially witnesses will fall off. Some are being bought off. Some are being coerced. Some are dying. And when that happens, you are basically not dealing with the issue itself. So one of the reasons it's slow is it's intentional. Second is you're dealing with a large bureaucracy in India, uh, which when you are fighting a state and its machinery at anywhere in the world, it, it could be very much in US or here, when you have a large machinery you're fighting, you need many more people on the ground. We actually in the Sikh Horn among six, you know, we claim to have 27 million diaspora. Mm -hmm. We don't have too many worker bees. You know, I put it to second generation these days that, you know, the revolution is not going to be twittered. You need people on the field doing things, then you need people who are twittering and writing about it on the Facebook. In our case, we, won't, we don't have too many foot soldiers in Gurdanak's revolution. Mm -hmm. So that's the other reason it's getting delayed. It so there's not a... of that, uh, I don't know if you know, there's a very famous, he unfortunately died recently, uh, Gil Scott Heron. Yes. He, he's an incredible r rapper as well as, uh, you know, uh, Roots uh, musician in yeah. terms of in the US. And uh, one of his famous tracks is, uh, the revolution will not be televised. Exactly, you exactly. Know? So, you know, essentially, uh, one is a state issue that is an intentional delay. Second is, I think, resourcefulness. 
people resourcefulness. I want to focus on that. It's not the money thing. I refuse to believe Sikh community is a very giving community. Mm -hmm. we, we have enough financial capital among Sikhs. And professionals. Exactly. So yeah. what we are missing is, the reason it's getting delayed is, not enough concerted effort from a people's angle, whether it's as a movement, whether it is a, a legal battle, whether it is constructing uh, a social movement, networking and alliance within the Indian confines and outside India. Uh, we, we can't just be talking about among six. That's one part of the puzzle. We need to talk at several different, in several different dimensions uh, to, to assure that these kind of efforts are leveraged to deliver something. Right now, we don't have very many deliverables. So I guess uh, in one perspective, it's like you've got a, a social level of networking, which is you bring the issue out to the fore. Uh -huh. And another level is more the physical networking, where you network within the institutions uh, that are there, whether they are in India or outside India, yes. so that they have empathy do you yeah. think rather than sympathy. Well, you know, uh, mm -hmm. in the, in the nonprofit world, you know, they talk about there are three things you need. Uh, there's the human capital, there's financial capital, and social capital. So I'm going to focus on the social capital here. Social capital actually has three ingredients to it. Number one is trustworthiness. So people who are trying to do these things, do they have enough trustworthiness? I would say there's a big issue within the community on that. Second thing is, are they building institutions to take care of this? I think pretty much we know the answer there. Mm. I mean, as I mentioned, Mr. Fulka tries to do it on his own. The only other institution I know who's effectively been, consistently been doing this is an soft organization outside of, uh, from, uh, from US, but working with lawyers in India. So institution building hasn't occurred to take care of this. You in your introduction mentioned, and six love to talk about parallels with the Jewish community. They build institutions. They have an organization called Searchlight, which still hunts down Nazi officers. Mm. As recent as three months ago, they Absolutely. did that. Yeah. So you know, it doesn't matter whether they're 90 years old. They're exactly. Gonna get, you know, the officer he was hiding in U.S. somewhere. Yeah. So you know, the point is, they build institutions to do it. So trustworthiness is number one thing. Number two thing is, are they building institutions to do this? And third is networking and alliances with other people of similar issues. I think at, bo at all three levels, our work is cut out. We really need to be working. Uh, diligently to get all three things done. That's what creates a real social capital. And okay. I would say we are missing that. I, I, th I think you're right. But in terms of the, what I would call, it's a new phrase I just thought of, by the way, uh -huh. the kind of good faith organizations, yeah. you know, doing things in good faith because they believe in it or the fact that they have a social conscience that they want to do something about it. Mm -hmm. uh, this week on the first, but in terms of the, what I would call, it's a new phrase I just thought of, by the way, uh -huh. the kind of good faith organizations, yeah. you know, doing things in good faith because they believe in it or the fact that they have a social conscience that they want to do something about it. Mm -hmm. uh, this week on the phone, I was just so amazed that I managed to talk to her, actually, because I only mentioned her on a program recently, and, uh, and then uh, one of the producers here said to me, well, I've got her phone number. Mm -hmm. uh, this is Simran Jit Kaur, uh -huh. and uh, she wrote a book called Saffron Salvation. That's right. Uh, it's an incredible book. I actually spoke to her on the phone two days ago, uh, and she's actually over here, and we're hoping to get her to... Uh, as, as part yeah. of an interview to talk to her. Now she does uh, work in uh, Punjab and she, she has an organization which is trying to yeah. look after the Shaheeds of that time uh, yeah. who are still s suffering. Uh, and you have a Sikh coalition, you have United Sikhs, you yeah. have a lot of these what I call good faith. And I don't mean in a bad way, yeah. I mean in a good way. You've got Sikh aid, you've got Khalsa aid. These are good faith. In the UK, uh, it's m made up of lots of people, you know, a lot of people from different uh, backgrounds mm. uh, who've migrated here over the years since the 50s and 60s and 70s and even way before that you know um, even if you look at Sikhs they've been in the UK since for about 150 years you know um, sometimes that's hidden it's even hidden in history when you learn it in school they don't really talk about that stuff um, but do you think that publishers are more concerned with uh, those kind of romance novels and those kind of you know put them on the put, put the paperbacks up there because they're quick reads for the summer you think they're not really interested in, uh, you know, true experiences, true life, which is an irony because TV is crazy about reality TV. Yet if you read the novels um, or even the books that are out there, Harry Potter, for example, is a hugely popular book. It's in five volumes. Um, I think it's five or six, I can't remember actually. But and there's loads and loads of films. It's fictional. It's um, fantasy. So do you think that publishers are into fantasy and romance and and the real world stuff is just boring. Well, it's, that's a very good question, but I think I'd like to relate it more to the Sikhs because I have come across, I've tried to do workshops when I've had time over the years. And so in Canada, for instance, in England, I've tried to do workshops with creative 
youth um, amongst the Sikhs. So you know, the, creative writing type work. Yeah, and yeah. um, uh, creative writing, trying to encourage their writing skills. And the one thing is that a lot of Sikhs, I mean, we, we are uh, quite paranoid as a Qom, and we have the right to be paranoid because we had a massive state machinery operating against us mm. since the civil disobedience in the early 1980s. Um, and basically this machinery uh, and the infiltration of many, many agencies uh, and the d physical destruction of our people and the torture of our people. Yeah, and also physical construction of buildings actually, and our, uh, you know, our heritage yes, as well. Like of our, our books, heritage, and, everything yeah. has actually um, has dented our psyche. Mm. So I have had a lot of people say, well, um, could a Sikh story really be told? Could it be published commercially? Mm. And the, the good news is this, that um, I tried a lot of um, publishers in the early days. My, the first um, version of Saffron Salvation, my father helped get that published. Um, and um, with, uh, uh, we also owe some um, gratitude to the Spokesman magazine at that time in 1999. Mm. They took the risk, and it's always a risk with India, but they printed the book. Um, so my father, um, who did a lot of work in the 1960s uh, with human rights in this country and the turban issue, he basically helped the first issue come out. Um, and then after that, um, a second uh, a human rights group, Voices for Freedom, that were part um, uh, of an American group, they published the second edition. So various groups, small seat yeah. groups have It's tried. a credit to you, the fact that all these people wanted to produce it, uh, another yes, uh, issue it because, is. because they uh, felt so strongly that the message within the book yes. uh, and the fact that it raises such, like, you know, the word that you mentioned, I think it's quite interesting, the consciousness, you know, mm. it kind of, you know, the resonation that occurs when you read it and you think, actually, you know, we, it's so, so believable because it's for real, you know. And um, I think what's, what's interesting is that when you, there was recently a documentary about 1984 and there were a few people asked it, you know, so I think especially the presenter, you know, a nice girl, and I think, I don't think even she was born or she was very, very young when it happened. Um, and so what people rely on is they rely on historical records or whatever media was there because there was a news blackout at the time as well. Mm -hmm. So there is a little bit of dilution and distortion that occurs. But by reading a novel, sometimes, you get to the heart of the matter. We look forward to seeing you next time.